Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It was pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I wanna puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Brodman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. Things that be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good, I like this. I like punching out this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible, just right there, like the big moon, just it was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course. Number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know, I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages up here at least. But in 2008 at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, cause you know, you, you poop and then 
gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the Palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet and you're like, really? Really you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick. Is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible. That's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Kicking off the list at number 10, Koremlu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Koremlu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? 
The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. Thought how to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly, and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre, and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's oriental cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again, I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four. Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. 
Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. It's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. Have they just called it Sweet Rays? Maybe they gave it up to the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce. And I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-tips were dipped in boric acid and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, <laughs> my eyes roll back every time. I get so, I go way too deep. I get too deeper, I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears? What's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero, gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure, thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath & Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually Teofana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Teofana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. That's not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Number 10, the switchblade comb. Hey, leather jackets, smacking jukeboxes, and a switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the Fonz on Happy Days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the Fonz is, the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, 
you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey. Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spend a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the Pisha deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, the all-in-one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Want to know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash or shampoo because we use it for everything, three in one. Yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love, like not putting the toilet seat down. Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart, and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me, and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see. I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go, and it's too cold in the winter to do it outside, so... That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men and it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged, and we make because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't, they taste horrible, it's awful. No one wants that, nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance. Taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? No. Oh. Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number three, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend. I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just like a clip-on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much, though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so. Number two, gendered products. 
Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed in the categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl-themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick, as I thought if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, hot pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me, and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses. We'll break those glasses because we're so strong. Oh, yeah. I just can't imagine wine in a can tasting good. It has to be worse than wine in a box, right? Uh, let me know in the comments, guys. I'm curious, what do you like to drink? Let Chetty know, I'm, I'm curious, I'd love to hear. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's a no calzone, red flag yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful. For some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. Seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients. Applicable powder and bugs. Yeah. You know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you could find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Place that glazed serving away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You just stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem, no problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. 
That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number 6. Nice Dentist Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day, you just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Could put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number 5. Well, I didn't have any corn! Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really, it's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that and you're just like, oh, what? It, it, what got that out of my mouth? That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number 3. Sunscreen This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the sons of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung, and people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes, and to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. 
When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you gotta souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. I, oh God, that just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake, ooh. Kicking off our list at number 10. Seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed. They have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so. Yeah, it was a rough time, either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice, which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone, they couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a officially outlawed, however, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings, because, yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and, of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of sh hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree. Still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in 
ye old west. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet. Or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the old west, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all, just to dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time, so yeah. I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy just, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in my, there's no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil, that's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair, so that'd be a fun two-in-one back then, that's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guy's doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up, clean up top, it's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pipple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my sh Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness, but in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old west saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff, the bartender back then would pour a drink, the cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that, please put that back. Back in the wild, wild western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bed like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're Paris. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour. Come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. 
Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. It's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the Old West rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm gonna grow it, thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the Wild West, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. Didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you want to call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and you know knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock. Those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. Number 10 is a rocky time because toilet paper didn't migrate its way over to Europe until the 16th century. Before, it was all sponge sticks and rocks, baby, and stones were actually a pretty common bathroom solution for the average Greek who used round pieces alongside ceramics known as pisoi, which translated to pebbles. They kept a pile of these pebbles in their lavatories in some cute little Bed Bath & Beyond brand wicker baskets for whenever it was time to freshen up. And similar to how we have the phrase, toilet paper doesn't grow on trees, they also had the saying to encourage a little frugality in the bathroom. Three stones are enough to wipe. But my favorite fun fact is some of these pisoi sometimes originated as ostraka, the pieces of broken ceramic on which the Greeks of old inscribed the names of enemies. The Ostraka were used to vote Big Brother style for some pain in the well, you know what, to be thrown out of town, hence ostracized. Check out the Bumblebee video Top 10 Historical Laws That Defy Logic to learn all about this strange law and phenomena, and maybe subscribe to our hive while you're at it to stay up to date on all our video releases. This creative recycling of Ostraka as Pesoy allowed you to quite literally wipe your on the name and representation of someone you hate. However, the downside is that ancient Greek society had immensely high case of hemorrhoids, so you win and you lose. Number nine is red lit pale face, and I'd say she was breathing in snowflakes too, but there wasn't any of that in ancient Greece. At least I don't think so. Well, nowadays there's a massive culture of skin tanning and darkening, but in olden times, it was the opposite. It was pale, pale, pale. People wanted to look like chalk, loaves of wonder bread. The closer your complexion was to that of HP printer paper, the better. Even if it meant the Greeks would powder their entire bodies with lead to achieve it. Now that was around 200 BC, but thankfully by 1000 BC, they'd wisened up and realized rubbing poison over their entire body maybe wasn't the vibe. So instead, they mixed it with chalk. Cause you know, diluted poison isn't as bad as the full thing, and then they smeared that everywhere. At least it was less deadly. After achieving the visage of freshly prepared mayonnaise, Grecian gals would then mix up some red iron deposit powder with fat or wax and rub that on her lips. And now, ice that cake with mascara. Don't worry, it's only a mixture 
mixture of egg whites, resin, and ammonia, you've now achieved the supernatural glam that doesn't make you look like the puppet from Saw at all. Number A is scrape it off. The ancient Greeks looked at bathing as aesthetic purposes first, actual hygiene second. Bathing wasn't to clean away dirt per se, rather to beautify the body. The Greeks did invent soap down the line, but prior to the advent of public baths in 600 BC, they started off using blocks of clay, sand, pumice, and ash that they'd rub away with olive oil after applying. The same oil that they'd then scrape off. This was done with a strigil. But that's okay. After 600 BC, you can always have a nice refreshing bath, right? Think again. Contrary to popular perception, not every city or village in ancient world had a public bath. Or even if it did, they weren't always open to everyone. Even when they were in fashion, if you were from a lower class, the best you could expect would be scrubbing yourself with old and pure olive oil that multiple people have already applied, scraped off, and returned to the same barrel for all poor people public use jug. If you were extra lucky, there would be a wash bowl. But then you'd be expected to Share it, or even the water with someone else. Speaking of, number seven is sweat sales. So unlike the poor who scraped oil off into a container and reused it over and over until it eventually became sludge, or the rich who could use oil once and then just toss it out, athletes of Greece would scrape their oils off into special little containers. It's the same with their actual sweat to be sold. Sweat could easily be collected with a strigil the same as oils, and it would carry the dead skin cells and grime with it. This was called goilo and the servants or athletes themselves would be expected to harvest it for people of Greece to do all sorts of weird things with it. These scrapings would then be sold as medicine, beauty products, perfume, you name it. People would rub the sweat of athletes on their skin, believing it to calm aches and pains, which it probably didn't do particularly well. If nothing else though, the Greek people, after rubbing some sweat and dirt on their skin, got to smell like an Olympian and enjoy some of the youthful vigor of the young men it came off of. At the same time, the gyms themselves would cash in on their users bodily fluids and would often scrape their walls and floors for extra good. Then invite companies to bid on the bottles of sweat. So the next time you're at the gym and you get off that machine and you leave that fresh layer of you do where your back used to be, wipe that crap off before someone harvests it and sells it like a freak. Number six is mystery creams. I only call them that because it's a mystery why they'd ever want to use these products as creams. I want to know who woke up one day and slapped some crocodile crap on their face. How did they figure out that this was a skincare thing? Someone had to be the first. I like to think that person fell in it, woke up the next day looking radiant, but whatever. Yeah, so crocodile dung was a big, big part of Grecian life because so were the animals, but it was far from being a nuisance. Vain folks saw this as an opportunity and the croc dung became part of many recipes for effective skincare treatment. This is face masks, contraceptive, hair masks, feet soaks. Hell, one recommendation for treating scars or crow's eyes around the eyes was by applying a little crocodile dung as eyeshadow. To quote a Greek medical document, levigate the dung of the land crocodile with water and anoint. If they have the means and the monies, people might even also have a whole dung bath in order to feel rejuvenated. I feel like that last one might have been a bit much, and considering the story of the ancient Greek philosopher Hercules, I am not far off in that opinion. Afflicted by swollen skin, he decided the best course of action would be some dung therapy. He buried himself in warm dung and mud in order to treat his condition, however, he stayed in the pile too long and ended up overheating and dying. Number five is some hair raising standards. As you can probably guess from looking at the statues and other works of art they left behind, the ancient Greeks weren't a big fan of bodily hair. For them, the ideal body, especially for women, was smooth like a dolphin all over. Naturally, in a time before Gillette razors and Shea Butter Shave Cream, twas not that simple. Since they didn't have modern waxing solutions or even razors, despite making the strigil, which if they had sharpened even a little, could have been made for the perfect razor slash hedge trimmer. So the simplest way of achieving the beauty ideal was to simply pluck out individual hairs one by one. A painful, not to mention time consuming process for your legs alone. Imagine trying to do that around back when mirrors haven't been invented yet. Fancy a swifter solution? Well how about burning all your body hair off? Also the custom in ancient Greece. Best part of that, a lot like today, is if you don't keep up with the societal expectation of shaving, you'd receive a lot of disapproval and discomfort from others. But unlike today as stated, it was a lot harder for them to shave so the fact that expectation was there is insane. This is all about the power balance of the sexes, however, as respectable women's ritualistic
animalistic deletion of her natural state attests to the male's supremacy over his objectified wife. While he has his manhood intact, she must deplete her womanhood and thus alter her innate form so as to uphold the classical ideal. Somehow that didn't apply to eyebrows though. No, no, no. Those had to be like full Frida Kahlo experience. The Greeks wanted their ladies' eyebrows to look like a push broom on their damn forehead. In case you ain't picking up what I'm putting down, unibrows were all the rage. Even if you couldn't get to grow one, you could always draw some in. Number four is the bush, the, a favorite of the 70s and of ancient times. Historically, ancient Greek men have had an absolutely fascinating relationship with their down there hair and how they cultivate it. The styles of trimming and manscaping changing per centuries in the overtures of cultural change. In the classic period, the trimming and even shaping, yes, shapes like a heart or a sparkle or a loaf of bread, I don't know, I'm just spitballing, were done on a men's down there. Naturally, this was easiest and most elaborately done by aristocrats, while the poor and common men did more basic triangles or squares or whatever you can do, I don't know. Anyways, by modifying his natural state down there, a man can remove himself from the realm of ordinary man. I mean, think about it. Natural down there growth equalizes every man post P, but the aristocrat elevates himself with this shaven distinction, idealizing its subject as a man more sophisticated than one who possesses unruly and uncontrollable tough. However, during the Tyrannicides revolt, Greek artisans started repping the au natural in challenge to this. In general, the artistic representation of pubic hair became more naturalistic, abandoning the archaic array of wildly shaven flourishes for simpler and subtler trim jobs. The Greek state began to show that it valued the average citizen with both its institution of democracy and by extension its more naturalized rendering of down their hair. The increasingly liberated down their hair on the mid 5th century masculine sculptures exemplifies this development. The ancient Greeks continued to fluctuate through down their hairstyles afterwards and their paper trail or perhaps hair trail isn't subtle either. Sculptors throughout centuries mark these changes as does scholarly works such as Asterophon's Listatria. Number three is teeth cleaners. Gotta get your chomper squeaky clean somehow. And back in ancient Greece, you had a few options. First off, powders would be made as toothpaste and these would be substances like lum, ashes, clay, peppermint, propolis, fennel seeds, cardamom seeds, and a magic substance called mastic. Mastic is also a resin that's a strong antiseptic. They also added abrasives like sand and crushed bones. These powders would be applied to a thin, dampened cloth, string, or twigs, all of which would be then used to rub, buff, and shine in between and on the teeth. By the time of the Roman Empire, the elites had actual servants whose job it was to clean others' teeth and you could visit them and pay for a wash job. Now to address the whole urine mouthwash thing we've all heard about at some point. It's true, but it's not. It's not like the Greeks were gargling the early morning dark yellow. They were adding derived properties from urine to their toothpaste. So that brings us to number two, which is the uses of urine. Similar to how you can harvest salt from water, you can collect important acidic properties from processing urine. This is still awful and gross but only because in modern times we're a lot more squeamish to concepts like that. In fact, people back then weren't even unaware that it was kind of crazy. The poet Catalyst once mocked his clean tooth enemy Agnetius, who to quote him, has shiny white teeth and grins forever everywhere. If he is in court when the council excites tears, he grins. If he be at a funeral pyre where one mourns a son devoted, where bereft mother's tears stream for her only son, he grins, whatever it may be, wherever he is, whatever may happen, he grins. And he curses him out by saying to him that the higher the polish on your teeth, the more it proclaims that you have drank your piss. The Roman Emperor Vaspian famously instated a urine tax by taxing the public bins where people dumped urine collected from toilets. The tax was so lucrative that it was continued by his successor Titus. The collected pee was then sold as an ingredient to businesses, workshops, and tanneries, which subsequently were taxed for it. These businesses used it for tanning leather, producing soaps, refining tooth products, making medicine, making elixirs and more. Ammonia, urine's key ingredients, was used by launderers to get stains out of clothes. And even farmers used it as fertilizer to grow the perfectly acidic fruits. Number one is Aunt Flo. It's been determined that there's a good possibility that women back then had fewer periods and lighter bleeding in ancient Greece than we do now in modern times, just because of diet, climate, and biological changes over history. But weirdly, the expectation was that they would actually bleed very heavily and regularly, and if they didn't, then rem Remedies needed to be used to bring out the blood. Aristotle mentions menstruation being like the flow of blood from a sacrificial animal that must be maintained. As for stopping the flow once it started, the ancient Greeks took after the Egyptians, using a small wooden splint as the tampon base, then wrapping wools and linens around it before cramming it on in. Reusable pads were also made of layering cottons and wools that can be easily 
evenly separated and washed later. Just remember not to wear any white in the hot Mediterranean sun while you're quite literally on the rag. Starting with trick number 10, Queen Caroline, the clothed bather. So I'm not gonna lie, like 80% of this list is gonna be bath specific because for some reason, royals got really weird with that. When Caroline arrived in England as Princess of Wales in 1714, she amazed the court with her regular bathing habits. She liked her skin and gowns to be clean and her servants well manicured, a completely unheard of requirement in the time. What can I say? In the 17th century, bathing was controversial. There was two sides to the debate. One that said that bathing was healthy and the other that argued it could damage your health, except in the most carefully prescribed circumstances. Now, her frequent bathing isn't subject of this section per se because we don't perceive that as uncommon today. The commentary is actually going to be how on Caroline would bathe with clothing on. Not like those big old elaborate ball gowns, but in like a boxy slip, yeah. Wet but fully clothed, she would have been dunked with warm water, rubbed with flannel cloths, and treated with soap solutions and cosmetic preparations like may do, or the milk of asses and mares, which is a lovely little segue into milk baths, number nine. You may think I'm about to spew off some Cleopatra facts and stories, which is fair. She and the Empress Papapea did make this treatment famous, but I'm talking about a different monarch and one funky decision she'd make after the bath. So milk baths use lactic acid, a alpha hydroxy acid to dissolve the proteins which hold together dead skin cells. Whether or not the ancients knew all that, they could tell it had a rejuvenating effect on their skin. Whenever she was suffering from a distressing malady, which is olden terms for a woman being upset, Countess Platten Hanover bathed in milk and then generously donated the contaminated milk to the poor. Lives of Queen of England, The House of Hanover, Volume 1 by Dr. John Dodon documented one such occasion, writing, Whenever Countess Von Platten designed to appear with more ordinary brilliance than her own person, she was accustomed to indulge in an extravagant luxury of a milk bath, and it was added by the satirical or the scandalous that the milk which had just lent softness to her skin was charitably distributed amongst the poor of the district wherein she occasionally affected to play the character of Dorcas from the Bible. Now to answer the age old question, why toilets are called thrones is number 8. So French King Louis was downright gnarly. If he was alive now, the dude would probably be one of those people that's part of like that no shoes movement and refuses to wear deodorant and just terrorizes Walmart with how they smell. He famously made Versailles so bad, it smells to this day. And apparently he only bathed three times in his entire life, which should probably be punishable by death because I can't imagine someone who has literally never bathed not smelling offensive. Apparently he changed his clothes three times a day and had a new perfume made every week to help, but this gross little weasel really went the full mile. He had a toilet seat under his throne and he would use it while addressing the court. Imagine dying of boredom during the king's mandate and all of a sudden he starts making faces and pausing in sentences and clinging to the throne arms trying to force out that day's dinner. Imagine accidentally making eye contact. I think I'm done with this segment now. And talking of unpleasant sights, Isabelline Brown is number seven on the list. Victorian orthonologists, that's a fancy name for bird science people, are some of the only fun sciencey folks out there. They like to use obscure adjectives when naming newfound species, especially those that are a predominant color. As a result, there are species whose names include such words as Cercelene, which is sky blue, Cenarius, which is ashy, and Citrine, a light olive for some examples. But my favorite avian hue is Isabelline. Why? Because of its off-color origins, that's why. So prepare to ratch. Isabella and her husband, Albert IV, Archduke of Austria, were the sovereign of the Spanish Netherlands from 1598 to 1621. British folklore goes that in 1601, a Spanish army led by Albert laid siege to Austin on behalf of her half-brother, King Philip III of Spain. Isabella apparently was feeling very, very confident in her husband's ability to win, so confident she vowed not to change her underwear until the city was taken. Unfortunately for Isabella and her entourage, her husband was not a great military tactician and the siege lasted until 1604, so three years. And for those three years, Isabella supposedly wore the same grubby underwear until they developed a range of unsavory coloration. Now if you're currently retching, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting up. Isabella, as a color description, was used before the siege in the year 1600, the inventory of Queen Elizabeth the first wardrobe. So if the color Isabelline predates the siege of Austin, then the expression must come from an earlier Isabella. The French, German, Italian, and Spanish languages all have versions of the word with a similar folk entomology, except that in all cases, the reference is to the eight-month siege of Granada by Isabella the first of Castile and her husband Ferdinand the second of Aragon. So if any royal Isabella did give their underoos the world's worst tie-dye job, then well, it seems likely it was Isabella of Castile. So let's talk about Isabella of Castile. For number 
six and her bathing ban, shall we? So, Philip II, Isabella's father, banned bathhouses in 1576. So apparently it's in the genetics to be downright filthy. This may sound crazy, but in Spain, the Christian doctrine saw bathing as a corrupt practice that could only lead to nakedness. Apparently, being a human in your most natural form was considered hedonism and something unreligious. God forbid if you splash some water on you too. So, this belief was to such a wild extent, Christians often walked from England or France to Jerusalem as a ritual without washing or changing their clothes. After the conquest of Granada by the Christians, the Muslims of Spain not only had to give up their religion to survive the Inquisition, but they also had to give up bathing. Isabella and Ferdinand ordered the Muslim baths to be destroyed and informed them that bathing was strictly forbidden. Isabella boasted that she herself, their leader, had only bathed twice in her life, and pretty much every historian takes her word for it. Makes sense that she would be so grimy they can name a questionable shade of brown after her underwear. Naturally, the Muslim people are absolutely horrified because cleanliness is literally mandatory in their religion as the prerequisite for every form and mode of worship, and by extension it had become culturally significant. To separate them from their religion and then ban their last remaining tie to it, that's dirtier than Isabella's briefs. Even when Columbus mentioned the daily bathing habits of the indigenous peoples of Bahamas and the Caribbean, Isabella was horrified to the point of rage and commanded them too as her new subjects to stop this blasphemous bathing practice at once. Yeah, so number five is the highly debated blood baths. Oh, you thought Kim Kardashian invented the vampire facial? Girl, please. The culture vulture ain't got nothing on this. So, enter Elizabeth Bathory, who was either genuinely a menacing sociopathic killer or a pawn incriminated by family. If she was the first one, then you could definitely count her fave beauty hack as uncommon. So, Bathory is often proclaimed as the most prolific female killer of all time, accused of more than 600 plus young women's deaths inside her lavish castle. According to legend, she believed bathing in virginal blood would grant her eternal youth. And according to witnesses, if you want to believe a bunch of biased people after her money, Bathory's crimes took place between 1590 and 1610, with the most vicious happening after her husband's death in 1604. And it would take the blood of three maidens to fill Bathory's clawfoot porcelain tub. She would also use the blood as lip tint and rouge, and Bathory's alleged crimes have inspired films, plays, operas, television shows, and even video games. And you may be wondering, what is that exotic scent? Well, it's number four, dead cat musk. Henry VIII had some fun and fabulous hygiene habits. He invented groom of the stool, didn't bathe often, and when he did, it was in an old and aged version of a wooden jacuzzi tub, and he always had someone else wash his undercarriage. Sometimes while taking these baths to ease the pain in his sore leg, Henry soaked a mixture of herbs, musk, and civet. What is civet? Well, the segment's name should probably imply it. It's a dead cat. It's a fancy kind of dead cat to be particular because it's small, wild, and carnivorous with a super distinct smell. I am not sure what cat musk smells like, but if it's anything like the smell of their spray, I am more than okay with not knowing. Like many people of his day, Henry also went to bed in a piece of fur so that fleas and lice would jump on it and not his royal skin. Which begs the question, wouldn't the fleas be confused if you smelled like a dead cat? Banned from drinking it, but love to bathe in it. Number three is Mary Queen of Wine. Get it? Because she's usually called Mary Queen of Scots, and Scots sounds like scotch. Went too far with it. That's okay. Anyway, so apparently Mary Queen of Scots wouldn't bathe in mere water, but in sweet white wine, as she believed it to be good for her complexion. She wouldn't touch a drop of the drink, being staunchly religious, but she still kept wine stores just to have poured in her bathtub, believing it to make her look pale and beautiful. Also, Mary equipped this as a form of pain relief. With venotherapy, including wine massages, face and baths remaining popular today, this shouldn't actually come as a surprise, especially because wine baths can be traced back to the times of Greece and Rome. There's even a very famous 16th century recipe called Afar Bella Fascia, which translates to to make a beautiful face. And it has a recipe to create a cosmic brew by boiling rosemary flowers with white wine. Quite a few people have tried it, as you can find the recipe online, and one tester group was called the Beautiful Chemistry Project, which studies its effects on skin quality and discovered that the process released essential oils and chemicals with antibacterial, moisture binding, collagen growth stimulating, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, brightening and soothing effects. Number two is the stuff of nightmare, it's the permed wig. This really came as a shocker and is quite weird. So when King Charles II had intercourse with ladies, he would collect some of their down their hair and then he would stitch it into a wig, which he donated to a club for rich nobles, I don't know, to like look at it, and then it was stolen from that club where someone starts another club where people came just to kiss this, the wig thing. 
Anyway, so King George IV was so inspired by this, he started doing the same. But unfortunately, he failed to complete his down there hair wig because he died before he finished collecting enough hair. Yeah, moving on. And last but not least, number one, ohagoro. So the Japanese custom of blackening one's teeth is an ancient practice. Whether in the famous Genji Monogatari, a book from the 12th century that is considered the world's very first novel, or in various fairy and folk tales, the art of blackening one's teeth held a prominent place in Japan's history for some time. One of the main reasons for ohagoro is the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded with immense beauty. It's only natural that people want to get closer to what they deem as beautiful, just like the process of having one's teeth bleached to appear more white in modern times. So, using a solution called kenimizu, made out of ferric acetate from iron fillings mixed with vinegar and tannin from vegetables or tea, the custom was first used to celebrate someone's coming of age. Around the end of the Heian period, teeth blackening was done by adult aristocrats and nobles regardless of gender on a daily basis. By the time we hit the Edo period in 1603, teeth blackening is a sign of nobility and aristocracy is exclusively, especially amongst wealthy married women trying to mimic the allure of a geisha. Even now when walking the streets of Kyoto, Japan's old capital, it's not uncommon to meet a mako with pitch black teeth. As you might know, during the end of the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period, Japan was visited by western foreigners after almost 200 years of seclusion. Being used to western beauty standards, many visitors were shocked to see women with black teeth walking around. Some even thought that the Japanese people had terrible mouth hygiene, mistaking the dye for actual teeth tooth rot, and then others, having realized the blackening was on purpose, wondered why Japanese women would disfigure themselves. Okay. So Ohagoro was banned by the Meiji government in 1870 to appeal to western opinions, and the art of dyeing one's teeth was almost forgotten. Today it can be seen in theaters, movies, and the aforementioned Kyoto, where Geisha and Maiko still roam the street. About all things hairy, and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to a to the throne. They were kidnapped and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times saying alright kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed, their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany, men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men. As explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head Shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment, as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. Studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent, and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also, nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards 
though, is nothing new. During medieval times, knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor, and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well, it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now, shaving was common during the Middle Ages. Commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today, and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many Middle Age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bathhouses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating, and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lime, or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cold like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, Casey didn't 
didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh, it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Meanwhile in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus or a gonf stick as well as a torchicool or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, where the torchicool was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw or moss or leaves or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags though when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag? Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street as did the live animals in the markets and so did the people. Also animals just kind of died in places and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses and the smell of diseased human or animal skin and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women would put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for Breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays people use q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringe-worthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tools should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth